It's that time of year, the spookiest of seasons, when ghost-type Pokémon haunt every hall. No matter where you look, their presence seems unavoidable. And despite the adoration these spirits have garnered over the decades, or the increasing number of ways they apparate into our lives, their haunting hijinks and horrors they can unleash must be contained. Thus, tonight, we'll be taking on this chilling challenge to track down and catch a ghost type in every mainline Pokemon game as fast as possible. Doing so may be the only way to make it through the season with our souls intact. With all that said, viewer beware, we're in for a scare. What better place to start a run than in Kanto? the region with the most infamous ghost-filled town around. But first, we have the question of which version to use, and although blue is off the table due to its low encounter rate for Nidoran Male on Route 2, which will be the carry of this run, the routes between red and yellow are quite similar despite changes included in the Pikachu Pact version. However, when analyzing the current world records up to our goal, red has a solid 4 minute lead, which is far better than the simple 9% higher ghost odds that yellow boasts, so we will stick with the classic. And as alluded to before, Nidoking is the key to these runs. Thus, after we get our Squirtle, take down the rival, and deliver Oak's parcel, we grab Nidoran. But make sure to keep Squirtle as the lead until Brock, where we get to do what I think is one of the funniest parts of the red speedrun, switch train our Nido. It's of course perfect, but the technique just doesn't really show up in most runs. Anyways, we can now turn the game to set mode and buy plenty of potions before heading on to Route 3, which contains a handful of mandatory battles, including the infamous Shorts Kid, who can be a bit of a pain, but is the only real worry before reaching Mount Moon. This area is the ultimate place to upgrade our Nido, starting out with the TM for Water Gun, some EXP, a rare candy, don't forget to grab the escape rope, an evolution, more experience, a moonstone, and because of it, another evolution. Additionally, make sure to keep an eye out for Paris, as we will be needing a cut user. With all that covered, we finish taking down Team Rocket and the Super Nerd, grab our fossil, and can head out to Cerulean. Here we get to actually use a Pokemon Center, grab another candy, and take on our rival. This one can be a bit tricky if you get hit with too many early sand attacks, but otherwise it's a straightforward attack spam with Nido. Speaking of, after we take down the first three trainers on Nugget Bridge, we can cash in our candies to hit level 23, which gives us our ultimate time-saving move, Thrash, which not only saves PP by lasting multiple turns, but also removes the need to even choose an attack while active, not to mention it's a bit overpowered at present. And with this move, we clean up the rest of the bridge and following route, saving Bill in no time to get our SS ticket. Then we get to use an escape rope from within Bill's house due to an oversight, which is another highlight of these runs, taking us back to the center and ready to take down Misty. This is certainly the most risky battle we have in this run. However, you can get lucky as I did this time, with Misty using an X-Defend, missing crits both times on Water Gun, and breaking through confusion to seal an immediate victory. Winning here nets us a more powerful water move in Bubble Beam, and more importantly, the ability to use Cut, which means all we need to do now is actually go get it. Heading right down to Vermilion, grabbing a few repels for the future, and hopping aboard the AM. Here, all we have to do is finish up an even easier battle against our rival in order to get our single HM of the run, as we will be heading out of town without taking on Surge, whose badge would provide us the ability to use Fly later on, but all of that and the time it would take to even get Fly is certainly longer than the one trip we would use it for. So, we head right into the fan club house, get a nifty bike voucher, and teach Dig to Squirtle as the club has the same properties as Bill's place, letting us warp all the way back to Cerulean, where we trade our voucher in for a bike and use Cut to gain access to Route 9, taking us right into Rock Tunnel. And despite the darkness, we won't be finding any ghosts here. Instead, we can use our repels and Nidoking to make it through without much disturbance, finally reaching the classic spooky town of Lavender, where we can head on into the iconic tower to take down our rival one last time, then up a floor in order to face our first ghost. Or, yeah, we can't catch them yet. Instead, we make a quick stop in the creepiest center ever before heading west to Celadon and its own tower, the Celadon Mart. Inside, we take the elevator to the fifth floor in order to grab 3x accuracies, which we will cover in just a moment, but we first need to grab some refreshments on the roof, a fresh water and soda for the nearby NPC who gives us Ice Beam and Rock Slide in return. We take the elevator back down, teach our new TMs, and bike on over to the game corner. Here we deal with the regular rocket routine, taking on a few grunts, some spin tiles, and finding the lift key. More importantly, we get one more TM for Horn Drill, which is in fact a one-hit KO move boasting considerable power with low accuracy and PP. 
However, we have answers to both of these issues. First, those X accuracies we bought will guarantee our moves hit, even bypassing the slight Gen 1 oversight that allows for a 1 in 256 chance of even 100% accurate moves to miss. And second, there are exactly 5 targets left that would even need this move before we reach our ghost. Thus, when we reach the final grunts, we use our first X accuracy on Ekans in order to horn drill the final Arbok. Then, after sweeping the next grunt, we can battle Giovanni, leading off with another X accuracy before ice beaming our way to the Kangaskhan, which we use our second horn drill on. As a reward, we finally get our ghost hunted gear, the Sylph Scope. Now we can dig out of the hideout, which takes us back to Lavender thanks to that quick heal, which completely nullifies any thoughts of a fly route. We head inside the tower for real now, where we have our final roadblock, the rival battle. But as planned, we use our last X accuracy, Ice Beam Pidgeotto, Rock Slide Gyarados, and then clear the final three with the rest of the horn drills. With this, we can make our way up to the terrifying third floor and run into our first ghost, a gas or a haunter. Ironically, this was lower odds than the Cubone, with Haunter at only 1%, but we will take it, catching our first ghost of the challenge and getting out of this tower. Generation 2 will again start by forcing us to determine the optimal version, but with much less of a Johto journey to worry about. As this gen introduced us to the Knight, and brought with it some early haunts being found as soon as Route 31 and Crystal, as well as the ever so slightly further Sprout Tower in each of the games. However, those unique Ghastly on Crystal's Route 31 have a measly 5% encounter rate. On top of this, if we compare the two version speedruns as before, Crystal will be around 50 seconds behind the base games by the time we hit Route 31's grass, mostly due to Elm's extended dialogue. Now from this point, it will only take around 2 minutes to reach the second floor of Sprout Tower and catch the extremely favorable 85% rate Ghastly. Thus, if we factor in that Crystal is already behind thanks to Elm, it will only be faster if it can snag a Ghastly in about a minute, which was far from what happened in my attempt. However, we leave this one up to the spirits, and simply remove an extra Ghastly from Johto thanks to this testing, but I suppose this makes up for the one we realistically should have found in Kanto. Okay, so although we have Daylight back on our side, the Hoenn region is the first run where things get tricky. Not because of the trek ahead, but rather one of the more unique mechanics this game introduced. And although this conundrum won't occur until we reach Rustboro City, all we need to do is grab a Mudkip and run right through the intro and mandatory trainers in our way. Now, the Pokemon that is causing this issue is one that certainly made me laugh when I realized it, Ninkata. As I'm sure you all know, this Pokemon has an entirely unique evolution gimmick. When it evolves at level 20 into Ninjask, if you have an extra party slot and Pokeball, you also end up with the bug ghost type, Shed Ninja. Of course, the issue here is not at all the empty party slot or extra Pokeball, rather reaching level 20 will need to beat any other ghost options available. Now if the ghosts are as far as, say, Lavender Towers were from Pewter City, level 20 would be a pretty good deal, but the problem here is that the next one is digging around in the very nearby Granite Cave, that being Sableye. So the question becomes, is it faster to continue the route until Duford or grind up Ninkata to level 20? Well first off, if we continue the run, we need to win our first gym badge in town, clear out Rust Turf Tunnel, get the deliveries from Mr. Stone, no, not, not that one, and head back to Route 104 to catch a ride with Mr. Briny down to Duford. All that's left then is to book it through the first floor of the cave, where on the second, Sableye is found with a 10% encounter rate, and double that if you end up on the next floor. Luckily for comparison, Nankata doesn't have too great of an encounter rate either, being equal to Sableye's best at 20%. Thus, we have about 10 minutes to find and evolve the bug. So then, is this possible? Well, no. Not from what I can tell. First off, Nankata will be at best level 7 when caught, along with a weak move pool which already limits our options. And more importantly, Nankata is in the erratic experience group, which you may not have known is without a doubt the slowest experience group in the early ranges, which covers all the levels of interest here. Specifically, Pokemon in the erratic group need a total of 12,800 experience to reach level 20, 2,800 more than the slow group. At level 7, Nankata will only have 637 experience, meaning we'll need a ghastly 12,100 63 experience within our time frame, which is just not possible. The highest amount of experience we could likely get would be Roxanne's Nosepass, and that will only give around 173 to our poor aspiring ghost. And no one should even think of the Zigzagoon pickup strat as pickup only has a 10% chance to proc and then an additional 10% roll to get a rare candy after each encounter and all of those goons, encounters, and item checks would need to come out of our 10 minutes which isn't feasible at all. Thus, we get to stick with the fun little goblin that is Sableye, which we just so happen to run into on the first floor anyways, removing one haunt from this cave and getting right out of here. Moving on to the DS with Gen 4. 
where our journey is a bit less complicated, however we will still be utilizing a unique mechanic. Speaking of, we have to make sure we play on either a Thursday or Saturday for this strat, although this won't come into play until we get through a bit of the game, specifically Diamond and Pearl, as Platinum proves to be a bit slower in our run, likely explained due to the looker cutscenes padding some of the early game, and the run itself is relatively simple, focusing on getting Chimchar enough EXP before Rorik to evolve and overpower the Rock-type gym. From here, we simply need to grab a few repels to use on our way over to Floraroma Town, and although this seems like the last area we might find a ghost, there are some evil events going on at the Valley Woodenworks, and Monferno is the perfect mon to take down Team Galactic's schemes which lets us start our own, saving the game and changing the date one day to Friday. Doing so makes Drifloon appear on the overworld as soon as we step outside. This weekly event only triggers after clearing out Team Galactic, but cannot occur if you did so on a Friday. Hauntingly, if you did choose to play Platinum, Looker has one last scene, here, which proceeds without issue despite Drifloon being right beside him. But with all this covered, we can run right up to the Doom Balloon and do our best to catch this fearsome entity. Unova, the region with Pokemon that seem to haunt more people than any other, but are beloved nonetheless. Now regarding our version selection, the sequels of course lend themselves to being very different games, and yet the target will actually be in the same location regardless of which Gen 5 game we choose. However, Black 2 and White 2 ends up holding a significant 7 minute lead over their predecessors by the time we reach our destination, which can't be attributed to anything in particular due to those differences. And the route to this location is familiar to any of you who saw the Evolution video, requiring us to take Tepig and travel across this new corner of the region, meeting with Alder, saving a stolen pup, and and even earning some medals. Not like anyone would actually be able to get all of those. Anyways, we do have one challenge ahead, with Charon's Gym. And in order to win, we need to get an extra encounter on our way there to take advantage of one of the most powerful moves in all of Pokemon, Defense Curl. You see, Charon likes to stack workups, and a pretty solid way to combat this without risking resets is to simply go plus six on Defense Curl and wish we had rollout to capitalize. Nevertheless, we get our victory and can proceed to do a quick shopping trip, grabbing some super potions, one escape rope, and spending the rest on repels. We can now make our way over to Verbank, sneaking by this pesky spinner where we have another gym to take on. But with the use of held Petra Berries and a new move in Flame Charge, we have far more insurance than the last, getting another victory and opening up the best part of the sequels, Pokestar Studio. Well, it's at least mindless, and believe me, we will still reach our resort well before the originals, especially since there isn't all too much left as we chase Team Plasma out of town and take a ride over to Castelia City, where we are gifted a bike to speed up the final part of our run, meeting up with Iris and heading to the sewers to take down our last Plasma Grunts. We can then step inside the nearby cave to use our escape rope as an immediate exit. The final gym awaits us, but the Bug-type Pokemon inside won't stand a chance as we sweep through everyone, including Berg, with our boar. Now we can bike north to take on our final roadblock, literally, Colrus. After this, we can bike the all-too-familiar path to the Desert. We try to stick to any bikeable paths, while avoiding trainers to reach the steps down to the Haunted Ruins. Inside, we are immediately greeted with a 40% chance to find our ghost, Unova's own Yamask, making a quick catch to escape the quicker sand nearby as the spirits are far from calm. Up next is the console where ghosts really could start to materialize, the 3DS with X or Y. And despite Kalos having the appropriately themed Route 14, and it's even more appropriately named Scary House, we won't need to go through such torture for our ghost. However, we will be able to follow the X speed run, which has some great strategies, specifically grabbing a Bunnelby ASAP in order to trade it in Santa Loon City for our mission's lead, Farfetch'd. This duck will single-handedly take us to our goal, starting over at the first gym that has its own infestation of bug-type Pokemon, which stand no chance against our new lead. From here we can head right to Route 4, where we only make a single stop for a repel before reaching Sina and Dexio. The two lead us over to Professor Sycamore, where Farfetch continues to clean house, this time against the Kanto starters, freeing us to head out, drop off our pair of much weaker mons in the box, and finish up in Lumios with a trip to the cafe. After this, we can head through Route 5, bypassing the double battle thanks to our singular duck, and use our found repel for the upcoming grass. We immediately run into a battle with Tierno, whose Corfish can use Swords Dance, but must be intimidated by all the ghosts we have gathered already, letting us leer away for another win. Now we can finish skating up this route in order to make a brief stop in Camp Riot Town's castle, before making our way to Route 6. Hey, listen. Okay, we are forced to see the Snorlax cutscene, but then we can run up the tree-covered lane on Route 6 onto Palace property, only to swing right back around into the tall grass on the side of the route. And here, we can find an Encada, which sadly again will not be our ghostly gal, but instead, 
Well, we found the 5% Kecleon, which I suppose could hypothetically become a ghost, but the true target is in fact Kalos' own edgy ghost, Honedge. Thus, we sheath up another hunt and can move on to the scariest generation to speed through. And that is, of course, everyone's favorite tutorial- I mean intro- I mean games, Sun and Moon. No, I'm just kidding. There are things I like about this game. Okay, thing. But these games will be great for us today, as we won't have to go nearly as far as our pal Mimikyu in order to catch our ghost. However, we do still have to go through a good chunk of the tutorials on Mele Mele Island. Meeting the professor, saving Nebby, getting our starter, and most importantly, using Pokemon Refresh twice prior to taking on the trainer school in order to get the 1.2 times boost to our experience, which will be useful as the final battle here is always a bit close. But with the chores done, we make our way into the city where, yes, a few more tutorials and a Pokemon Snap ripoff lies ahead, but we get to have a very abbreviated shopping trip as we only need a single X special attack for the upcoming battle. Although it isn't for the simple Team Skull Grunt at the docks, but rather Illima where we use our purchase to set up on Young Goose before one-shotting Smeargle with Water Gun. And now we are finally free to run back and reach Route 2, where we get to do everyone's favorite trainer skip before running up the hill and right into the Howley Cemetery, marking another very appropriate area to find some ghosts. And a solid 80% rate regardless of the game, and although I used Daylight to lessen the horror we would face in this region, it did result in finding another Drifloon, marking our first legit dupe so far. As has become tradition in these challenges, let's go on over to the Let's Go games. And these truly are unique to speedrun. As I touched on last time, the majority of the run is based around filling the decks up to 50, which is a prerequisite for taking on Koga's Gym. Now this requirement sounds pretty clear cut, but since it's all based around what Pokemon actually show up in any given location, runners are often required to make split second decisions that can impact both the dex route and actual party members used. All of this adds up to a much more interesting run than I ever anticipated a Generation 7 game to have, but technically since we don't have to reach Koga's Gym, it doesn't matter for us. Well, not quite, as although we don't need to meet any real requirements, catching Pokemon is the only efficient way to gain experience, which we will need some amount of for progression. Last time, I tested out using Diglett Cave for its consistent Diglett spawns and solid experience along with a team of just our starter and Gloom. But this time, I wanted to test the speedrun strats a bit more with some modifications for our spooky purposes. Thus, we start out exactly the same, heading straight for the end of Radiant Forest, where we pick up our first lure, using it immediately, and catching the first few Pokemon we see, and specifically grabbing an Oddish, which we will use shortly. After this, and throughout the run, we make sure to remove unnecessary party members since there's an animation for each level of Pokemon games, and with mandatory experience share and new move prompts, this can save a good chunk of time. Anyways, we can now show off Oddish to the Gym Bouncer in order to make short work of Brock's team using Absorb. With our first badge, we can go do some shopping, selling around 40 Pokeballs in order to pick up some Great Balls, an X Special Attack, two X Attacks, and some Antidotes, a Burn Heal, and Awakenings for safety. We can now speed through Route 3, dodging all the trainers, grabbing a lure behind the bush, and going straight to Mount Moon. Inside, we will finally continue some catches, but first take down the mandatory Lass and Youngster with Oddish before we go down the nearby ladder, where we can grab the Hidden Moonstone and Nugget, which will be used later. This area is also perfect to quickly catch a few Geodude for experience needs, as they are the easier catch of the two Pokemon with the highest encounter rates in Mount Moon. Further, we want to continue catching Geodude as this creates a catch combo, which even a combo of one will increase both the odds for more Geodude and, more importantly, the experience we get. And finally, focus on any with auras as they provide an additional size bonus to our EXP multiplier. The goal is to get just enough experience so that the final battles with the Super Nerd and Team Rocket trio put us right at level 15, but if you end up short, you can make one final catch on your way into Cerulean. Here we teach the incredibly named Zippy Zap over Thundershock before taking on the gym, just passing the level 15 check at the front. We make quick work of the single mandatory trainer before taking on the final gym leader, using an X attack for safety but landing an unnecessary crit on Starmie for our second lucky misty battle of the run. Now it's time to make quick work of the rival, the bridge battles, and the one mandatory fisherman on our way to Bill's house where we earn some more boat tickets. On the way back, make sure to grab the lure in the corner as it may be needed for our next catch. Speaking of, we can now head towards Vermilion, trading our rival one of the SS tickets for some revives before grabbing one more nugget and a lure in the underground. And before leaving, we use a lure as our next catch is right outside. But also, we need this lure for one mechanic we haven't touched on yet. That being, Pokemon which spawn off a lure are at 1 plus their normally highest possible level. And not only is that generally useful, we are looking for Growlithe that is specifically level 17, 100 
higher than its maximum here, as it just so happens to learn flamethrower at that level in these games. Now we can head into Vermilion, running down the middle of the campers to dodge both of them. Once here, we make our final shopping trip, selling the nuggets and fossil to buy plenty of great balls, super potions, and X attacks, then a pair of lures, one repel, and an escape rope before spending the rest on X special attacks. It's now time to use those tickets, hopping on the Anne, where we swap Growlithe into our second party slot, call in the second player, and take on our rival. And while Growlithe isn't incredibly necessary here, with Pikachu sweeping Pidgeotto and Eevee, it will be able to flamethrower Oddish to clean things up. This lets us grab Cut from the Captain before heading back to Cerulean, making sure to dodge those campers above Vermilion on our way back. Once here, we can now access Route 9, where we will keep Player 2 out for the pair of mandatory battles ahead. The first of which is the Picnicker, who has a Gloom that Growlithe will easily handle, and the second, a Camper, which we can X Special and Flamethrower through as well. Route 10 is where things get interesting. In the speedrun, it's advised to get the Nidos and run with either a King or Queen throughout the upcoming events. And while I will be using this strat for its general power, there is another team member we will grab inside Rock Tunnel to supplement our minimal catching routes, loss, and levels. Specifically, we want to find a Rhyhorn, as not only will the lure set it to level 24 and has some powerful moves, but we can ride on its back for significant speed boost the rest of the run. We then throw down that rappel and take on a few mandatory trainers, using Nidoking for support wherever needed, before finally making it over to the only truly spooky town we seem to visit in this run. And just like Gen 1, we have some non-ghost catching business in the tower first, taking down our rival using Nidoking for a bit of extra power, and then going upstairs to meet the currently uncatchable ghosts. And yes, I did try to see what happens when you encounter these, and it actually warps you back to the first floor. But we can do one better with the escape rope to warp outside and make our way through the next route. On the other side, we reach Celadon, and the final set of roadblocks, all at the game corner. And things are pretty straightforward to start, taking down the mandatory trainers that lead us to the lift key. With this, we can take on our final gauntlet, and here is where the addition of Rhyhorn really shines, cleaning up the Team Rocket Trio's poison types before Pikachu can shine a bit more in taking on Archer's Golbat and Giovanni overall. Finally, we can grab that self scope, taking the elevator to the first floor and running outside where we get this game's version of Fly, Skydash, taking us back to the tower one last time where we can scope out a bunch of ghosts that disappear, but eventually track down a Ghastly, which in hindsight could have used an Abberry to chill out, but regardless is caught, being only the second Ghastly we've dealt with so far. But the hunt is far from over, as we head out to the haunting hills of Galar, where we have a lot of ghouls to discuss. As per usual, there is nothing for us in the intro routes, however, as soon as we hit the wild area, a gaggle of ghosts are just within reach. The first of which is actually one of my partner's faves, Golette. However, it can only be found during sandstorms, which can't be triggered until we reach Hammerlock. So, our other option is a roaming haunter in the same location, but it can only be found at level 31, and with a total of zero badges, we can only catch up to level 20 mons. Instead, we can float on over to the Isle of Armor for our ghost. And there are actually quite a few options as well, but first we need to get through that intro material, which actually starts by setting your date to an appropriately spooky October 15th, or you can do January 15th I suppose. From here, the intro goes as expected, meeting with friends and family, and getting our starter, who is appropriately fearful of our journey, Sobble. After finishing up in the slumbering weald, we make sure to catch a Wooloo on our way into Wedgehurst, as catching something now lets us bypass the later catching tutorial. And after finishing up the research lab, head right to grab a nearby rare candy, which will be critical for one particular event in just a moment. But before that, we meet up with Hop at the center, drop off our Wooloo, and head to Route 2, where we get to now skip that tutorial and dodge one trainer before making it to the professor's house. Here, we simply take down Hop again, and can then head off to the station, snagging a quick catch on our way to get just enough XP for level 11. From the station, we can head to the wild area, and after a few more cutscenes, we are finally free to move our plans forward heading right back to Wedgehurst to take advantage of the DLC areas. Once here, make sure to use that rare candy we grabbed to have Sobble reach level 12. Matching with the Galarian Slowpoke, we are forced to catch, as this removes the difficulty factor introduced in Gen 8 when catching Pokémon above your level. And although our capturable ghouls are at the Isle of Armor, we need to first head over to the Crown Tundra. Here we toss our extra mods in the box, and then get introduced to Peony, who absolutely demolishes our poor Sobble, but then leaves us to our business, which you might call some light trick-or-treating, as we grab some recurring items that can be various sizes of XP candy, ending up with a small and medium candy, which is plenty for our poor beat-up Sobble. Now we can head back to the station, use our candies to evolve Sobble into Drizzile, and head off to the haunted Isle of Armor where we easily take down Avery with our powered-up starter, and now have to make a hefty trek all the way over to Challenge Beach. 
Here is the first possible ghost one could find, as Delmize, of all things, can be found at a 10% rate in fishing holes. And we do in fact start with the rod in these games. However, with the time it takes to find the spots and the low odds, this will almost certainly take longer than the nearby haunts. Although I wouldn't blame you for fishing, as Delmize is certainly a great ghost to add to the roster. Instead, we run a bit further through the aptly named Courageous Cavern and out onto Loop Lagoon where we find some ominous fog set in due to our original choice of date. As, for some reason, despite there being three weather conditions, fog, blizzard, and sandstorm as mentioned earlier, that require prerequisites we have not yet met, this doesn't apply to fog in the DLC areas. And with fog, Drifloon can be found both as an overworld or random spawn. Yet despite all this, if a Drifloon is not seen on the overworld, taking a few steps further to the sand guarantees us a brand new ghost, Sandy Ghast. The only caveat with either being their max level is 21, just above our level 20 catching range, which of course happens on the first encounter. But nevertheless, we can quickly check a second and add this ghoulish gasol to our collection. Now we head back to the origins of Sinnoh with Legends Arceus, where you will never guess which ghost needs to be contained, but we appropriately need to be able to hunt in the darkness this time. So we have a few tutorials to roll through, eventually getting our starter Cyndaquil, being introduced to the clearly haunted Obsidian Fieldlands, and returning to get some proper ghost hunting gear. With this all done, we can head back out to the Fieldlands and finish up Akari's final three meetups before we can warp back to camp and set the time tonight. With this, wild Drifloons spawn all over the place, including in our current area, the Aspiration Fieldlands. They can be a little aggressive, but there are plenty to go around, and thus the Gen 4 inspired games appropriately add another Drifloon to our group before we head on to the final job. And what better way to end than with a game that has the most nightmare fuel built right in? All joking aside, we have gotten to do some interesting things during the previous Paldean parts of our challenges, but this one falls more in line with the side deck side of things. As always, we first need to go through the intro, which for me has become the scariest thing to say throughout these challenges, but is as simple as usual, grabbing a starter, going behind Nimona's house for a battle, running into a gate to progress, and wrapping up the regular tutorials on Pocopath with Nimona, the Box Legendary, and Arvin. With all this done, we could start our search, which... Wait, what's that up there? Well, this is a Gimmagool chest, which would be the perfect ghost to end our run with. However, it is not technically accessible at the moment, since we need our post-intro legendary ride, and there doesn't seem to be any solid way to finagle our way without it. Unless we can find a way to use some of our crude ghost's energy, we are out of luck. Instead, we can run right across the creek and all the way out to the southeastern corner's ruins where we are greeted by a whole gang of ghastly, some of which seem to already be out of control, and thus make quick work of our final capture and complete the challenge. And that's it, a ghost from each game. And hey, if we count both from Gen 2, that makes an almost ominous 12. How perfect. And it only took a total of 9 hours, 8 minutes, and 36 seconds. But what did you think? Hopefully this keeps the ghosts at bay for you this season, and we can all enjoy the festivities. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments, and if you enjoyed, subscribing and liking helps a ton. I'm working on many more projects both for Pokemon challenges and some Pokemon related mysteries. Speaking of, if you haven't seen my last video where I dive into the depths of the internet for a hidden secret surrounding a 20 year old Yu-Gi-Oh game, it might be my best work yet, and would give you a taste of what other Pokemon videos I hope to make in the future. Anyways, thanks so much as always for watching, I really hope you enjoyed, and happy Halloween everyone.